Niels Bohr was also looking towards what Planck and Einstein were doing, and he knew that elements gained energy, that they would release that energy in specific amounts. So you may recall doing a flame test in grade 11, where you would subject different elements to the flame, and the atoms of those elements would become excited, and we knew that they would emit a certain color, and you could figure out an unknown element based on matching it to known flame colors. If we take this one step further, what we can do is we can take that flame color and we can subject it to a prism or diffraction grating or what's known as a spectroscope. And when we take a look at that flame color through a prism, we would notice that it would either yield a continuous spectrum if it was white light or it would yield an emission spectrum, a unique series of colored lines that was only um, specific to each element. So it really was like a barcode or a fingerprint that helped to identify what the element was. So what we can also do is we can use a gas discharge tube. So in these tubes, they are vacuum sealed with a given gas. And what we can do is we can pass electricity through it to see um, the color that they give off. And then in doing so, we can use a diffraction grating to take a look at those colors. Just to place this uh, diffraction grating in front of a camera and show you the view of this continuous um, source with a diffraction grating in place. And what you'll see uh, in the image is, is the, uh, the image of the, of the incandescent bulb itself. And then to the right and to the left, you'll see uh, a rainbow spectrum that shows which, what wavelengths are present in this. You'll see, um, as you look on the right side, uh, violet through all the colors of the spectrum, all the way through red. What this is, is a, it's a discharge tube. It has mercury in it. And what I'll do is um, energize this tube, uh, uh, apply a voltage to the tube, and that causes the, the gas in it to emit spectral lines according to the spectrum of the, of the element that we're using, in this case, mercury. This is a mercury spectrum uh, without the diffraction grating. Let me get it in focus here. It's a bluish colored uh, spectrum. There are um, mercury vapor lights that are used as um, street lights. So this may look similar to this bluish tint to the mercury vapor. Now let's try it with the diffraction grating in place. And what you see in this case are uh, a green line and a blue line predominantly in this mercury spectrum. So this is nitrogen spectrum. And with the diffraction grating in place, we see a number of lines present. Some red, orange, yellow, green, and a, a violet uh, turquoise-ish colored line. So this is hydrogen. It has a, a reddish cast to it. And uh, when the diffraction grating is, is in place, you'll see three lines. Uh, the farthest from the central image is a, a red line. That's the hydrogen alpha line. And it is um, very important in star images. Uh, a lot of uh, nebula in the, in the sky have hydrogen alpha line as one of their prominent um, spectral lines. Then there's a turquoise colored line, greenish blue, uh, is the hydrogen beta line, uh, both from the Balmer series. And we'll talk about those, uh, or have talked about those in class. And then finally, the hydrogen gamma line is a uh, violet line, is generally considered to be the, the one that's, th those three lines are visible in the, in the hydrogen spectrum. 
Now, in his mid-20s, Niels Bohr actually went to Cambridge University in England to join the group um, working under J.J. Thompson. And at the time, Thompson's group was attempting quite unsuccessfully to explain the electrons and atoms and this atomic spectra. And Bohr had suggested that tinkering with this model would never work and that some revolutionary change was required. And Bohr's hunch was that a new model required using the new quantum theory of light developed by Planck and Einstein. Thompson did not like these revolutionary ideas, especially from a, you know, a young guy fresh out of university in Denmark. And they had many heated arguments. And so Bohr decided to abandon Thompson's group in Cambridge. And he actually went to the University of Manchester to work with Rutherford. And it turned out to be, um, you know, a much better environment for him to develop his um, theories. You know, Rutherford's description of the atom couldn't account for some of these observations. So a second limitation of Rutherford was that um, if the electrons were actually just sort of hovering around at any distance, then the light emitted from them should be spread evenly across the electromagnetic spectrum, and every element should be producing a continuous spectrum, just like we saw with the white light. But that was not the case. So Bohr decided to, you know, work primarily with hydrogen. Why not start there? It's the smallest atom. And to try and explain the bands, the colored bands that he saw within the line spectra. So what he proposed was this planetary model of the atom where the electrons, he said, were found at discrete um, distances. So he reasoned that, you know, if the... Um, light was being released at these certain wavelengths, then electrons can only have certain energies. Just like a gearbox in a car can only have certain gears, like first, second, or third, he said that the simplest arrangement would be a planetary model with each electron orbit at a fixed distance with fixed energy. In this way, the energy of the electron would be quantized. In other words, the electron could not have any energy, only certain allowable energies. So what he postulated was that electrons can only move in certain fixed orbits, each orbit corresponding to a specific energy level. An electron can only move within an orbit without losing any energy. An electron can only move from one orbit to another when it gains or loses energy. The energy levels are much like the rungs of a ladder, but they are not equally spaced. So what he noticed was that energy level number one um, would be fairly close to the nucleus. And then energy level number two was quite a big step away. And then energy level number three, four, and five were a little bit more close together. Electrons could not exist um, anywhere in between these steps, you know, only on one step or on the other. So on one orbit or another, you couldn't exist in between, just like you couldn't hover between steps when you are walking up a set of stairs. So again, here is our gas discharge tube. When you pass electricity through it, what happens is the electrons become excited. When they become excited, what we think happened was that these electrons, they would start off in their specific ground state, and then they would jump to a higher energy level known as the excited state. And in doing so, they would absorb a certain amount of energy, and that absorption of energy would correspond to a certain wavelength of light. When it fell back down, it would release that energy in the form of a color, a corresponding color that corresponds to that wavelength. In the Bohr model, the electron circles the nucleus as if it were a planet going around the sun. And with a nod to energy quantization that Max Planck dreamed up for solving the ultraviolet catastrophe, Bohr said that inside the hydrogen atom, the electron was allowed to have only discrete values of angular momentum in its orbit around the nucleus. Translated, this means the electron can occupy orbits only at certain distances from the nucleus. And Bohr simply dismissed the problem of an electron radiating away its energy by stating that it just didn't happen. Even great scientists cheat sometimes. He postulated that inside an atom, electrons only radiate energy when they jump from one allowable orbit to another. 
and the energy of this radiation reveals the allowable orbits. The wavelengths of light absorbed by hydrogen, when white light is shined upon it, as well as the wavelengths of light when it is subsequently re-radiated, had been precisely studied at the time but never explained. Here's a sample of an absorption spectrum and an emission spectrum. By predicting the value of orbits that an electron could have, Bohr's model also predicted the wavelengths of the lines in the hydrogen spectrum. And his model was tremendously successful. It explained in exquisite detail the atomic spectra of hydrogen. When the energy of the wavelengths of the spectral lines are compared to the energy differences in orbits allowed in Bohr's atom, they agree exactly. So the quantum approach worked well in explaining the allowable orbits. But no one was certain why only those orbits were allowed. So Niels Bohr um, basically stated that electrons can jump from one energy level to another. And without going into great mathematical detail, what was clear to Bohr was that electrons, um, when they did this jump, this is called an electron transition. And this transition from um, a lower energy state to a higher energy state, what happens is they will lose energy and this energy is released as a photon of light. And this jump can also be referred to as a quantum jump. Ground state is the state where the electrons originate and the excited state is the higher energy level state that they've been promoted to. You're going to notice here with this particular diagram, we have got three wavelengths of light um, that are specified. There's four actually for hydrogen, but three on this Bohr model. And you'll notice that red light is associated with um, least amount of energy. When you look at the visible spectrum, red light has low energy and hence it will have the smallest jump associated with it. And when that jump happens and that electron falls back to its ground state, it will release that color red, a certain wavelength of red you know, specifically 657 nanometers. And then we will have the blue color, for instance, is associated with higher energy. So that electron made a bigger jump and that bigger jump um, results in that electron falling back, you know, a much farther distance, releasing a photon of light in that blue spectrum. Now, excited states are fairly unstable and electrons, you know, they fall back quickly to their ground state. What goes up must come down and they don't necessarily fall back in all one step. So if an electron, let's say, um, you know, starts off at energy level number one and it absorbs enough energy to move to energy level number three, it may fall back in one full swoop and um, release a certain wavelength of light or it may fall back in a series of steps. Okay, so you can see in this diagram that it may, you know, fall back to energy level number two first, release a certain amount of um, energy and wavelength of light, and then fall back um, from that point back to energy level number one. Note that electrons that are falling back to energy level number one are always releasing um, ultraviolet light. And Electrons falling back to energy level number two are releasing visible light that we can see with the naked eye. And electrons falling back to energy level number three are releasing infrared light. So we can't detect ultraviolet light or infrared light with the naked eye, but notice that those jumps are all happening as well. So even though we can't see them, those electrons in that gas tube for hydrogen, those were also happening. The color that we see that's being emitted by the hydrogen gas tube, that sort of purpley color, um, you'll see here, this is a culmination of all the jumps that are happening. And that is the color that we will see. And only when we separate that flame color or use a diffraction grating with that discharge tube, will we see the visible bands of light. But remember, 
all those other ultraviolet infrared are also happening as well. The problem with Bohr's model is that his calculations only worked for um, atoms that have one electron. So the hydrogen atom or helium with one electron removed or the cation of lithium with a plus two charge. Calculations for other atoms did not agree with these experimental results. And so we have to look a little bit further in developing a new theory to help us explain where these electrons are located. This will take us into what is known as the quantum mechanic model. And here we will get a bigger picture of where these electrons are located. And it will enable us to account for um, you know, some new quantum ideas. Bohr's theory was a great success because it was the start of a new approach, but now it's time to move ahead.